Uh, my name's Phil Nash, uh, and I'm a developer evangelist for Twilio. Uh, I'm mostly standing out at a table over there. Uh, and I just wanted to tell you a, a little bit about Twilio today and then write some code, because I don't think we've seen enough code just yet. So I hope that's okay with you. Um, so quickly, Twilio is a um, communications uh, API, a platform for you to uh, add um, uh, sending and receiving text messages or making and receiving phone calls into your applications using uh, the tools, the languages, the frameworks that you're already using. And as I said, I just want to build a very quick app today to show you how that works. Um, so this is Twilio and this is me and my account. And everything in Twilio kind of starts with a phone number. Um, if you want to send messages to it, you're going to need one. So I'm just going to buy one uh, here in Spain. And if you are Spanish or have a Spanish uh, phone, I'd uh, insist you get it out of your pockets right now because that's going to be really useful. I have an address. Oh, God. It's all gone horribly wrong. Forget that. International people. How about you guys? You can do this. <laughs> I'm going to do this in, in the UK to make sure this works. Oh, that was a that was, that was nightmare. Good. You need an address in Spain to get a number, uh, and I don't have one. So let's get a UK number. Uh, and if you buy that number, that's my number. And that's wonderful. And so, in order to make this work, uh, we have to give Twilio a URL. Because um, what happens is when you receive a message at this phone number, Twilio takes that message, bundles it up into an HTTP request, and makes it to your server, or in fact, my server in this case. So I'm just going to add that in there. Uh, and I'm going to put it to something that's running here on my laptop. Um, there we go, cool. So we're just going to make a post request to that URL. And that URL. That's going to load slowly, I guess, in the background. That URL points at this application, currently empty. So let's build one. Uh, I'm just going to require Sinatra, because we've talked too much about Rails today. Uh, and um, we're just going to write that post uh, request uh, to messages. And all we do with Twilio is return some XML, uh, not JSON, certainly not protobuf, as I'm afraid, uh, but XML. And that XML is pretty simple, thankfully. So um, uh, you can just send a response, and in terms of a text message, for example, we can respond uh, with a message. Um, so I can say, hi, full stack fest. Uh, here's a promo code, because I'm feeling generous. Uh, this will get you um, uh, $20, $20 of free credit. Um, uh, and if you want to ask me any questions, I'm uh, Phil Nash on Twitter. Lovely. We'll end that message. Um, and save that, and I tell you what, we'll just run that server, uh, and that is um, being served. Someone's done it already, that's amazing. Um, <laughs> who managed that? Uh, this is the phone number. You took that off screen very quickly. If you have any, if you don't mind sending a message internationally, please do send one to that, and you will get that response back, and we'll be very excited. I'm gonna send one right now, uh, so it's plus four, four, seven, four, eight, one three four seven six zero one and I know I'm sending let's see what's happening so we're getting some messages coming in uh, if you've received a response back give me a shout <laughs> good stuff uh, I just got one too that's cool um, so I'm just gonna get out of that and uh, then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our rest API because we have a rest API as well uh, because we want to be able to make these things happen as well so I'm just going to require our oops, uh, Twilio library. We have libraries in other languages, but who needs those? Uh, and create myself a REST client uh, and give it my account, SID and auth token, which is basically the uh, username and password for the API, which I'm keeping hidden from you. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm keeping hidden from you, and I'm just going to go and get those messages that we sent to that number. Uh, so I'm just going to list them out. I still like hash rockets, by the way. Uh, and then I can put those on screen, so I hope nobody sent anything bad, because, um, you know, codes of conduct and stuff. Um, and also, I might just steal your phone numbers as well, because I can. That's OK, right? <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to put the message body and return the number you sent it from. Lovely. Uh, so there's some good stuff. As we can see, it works with emoji. Um, <laughs> it's good to see. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> but we're not done. We're not done. We're not done. I hope we're not done. Because, because I took your numbers, I can call you back, right? Um, and uh, num, with that num, I can go, I can take my client and create a call uh, to your number from my number and give it another URL. And I'm going to write this URL out pretty quickly because I'm probably running out of time. Uh, so with the URLs, we can do a lot of other stuff with voice, uh, such as we can uh, use a uh, robot voice, uh, for example, to speak things out to you. And we can play, um, what do I call that call? We can play back MP3s over the line if you want to do a recorded message or just play lovely music to people. Um, but uh, right now, I think this is time to get a bit hexed XML. Uh, time to get a bit more social. We're about to get to the party time, so why don't we all have a bit of a chat, or at least anybody who uh, texted in have a bit of a chat, because I can dial you uh, into a conference, uh, which would be pretty cool. Um, Baruco, let's call it. Uh, and that would be nice. So once I hit go on the thing in just a minute, uh, numbers, your, your phones will start to ring, and you'll be able to chat with each other. So that's going uh, right now. It should start working. Uh, and whilst that goes, I'll just tell you that my name's John Ash. I'm a developer evangelist for Twilio. I'm out there all day, so come and say hello. Uh, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, okay. Hi, I'm Peter. I want to talk to you about Rick of Lightning Talk. Uh, this is Catalan, in case you were distracted by the speakers pretending that this is a Spanish area. Um, so uh, let's look at some code. The code is awful. There are many things wrong with this code. Let's look from the bottom. The initialize takes a parameter that it doesn't use. The uh, snake case method performs a nail check, which we learned is a very bad thing to do. Uh, it actually takes a control parameter. So the color of this method actually knows which path this code will take. It, uh, the parameter is a Boolean flag. So that's another problem. It calls uh, the nil check twice, and it actually has no descriptive comment. I won't go into details whether having or not having comments is a problem. There are two sides to this issue, and the truth is usually in the middle. But uh, let's look a bit further. This conference class uh, can uh, compute the distance, the direction to the conference, and the uh, distance can be computed in two, uh, two ways. So what's wrong? The distance to method is really badly named. The, uh, all of this tests the latitude and longitude at least three times, and it also takes uh, latitude and longitude together to four different methods now because the f constructor was the first one. So let's go a bit further. Do we have excited attendees? We take a collection of attendees, partition them whether they are excited, and check whether the excited are more of them than indifferent ones. The problem with this method, though, is that it has nothing to do with the conference. It only operates on the attendees, which is a utility function. Uh, so it could be moved to anywhere else in your code and work just as well. This one actually operates on the object because it checks the city of the conference, but still it operates much more on the attendees uh, collection, so it's a feature envy. This method probably should be moved to the attendees uh, collection. So there are very good reasons what you, why you would write code like this. So there's nothing always obviously wrong with this code, but there are also some smells. So all of the uh, things that I showed you are things that are output by Rick. And Rick is basically like Rubocop, but for your architecture. It checks whether you're making any OOP violations and uh, uh, flags them as smells, and you can plug it into your Rake task or your CI. So you can configure it as, uh, as you like. So if you have some methods that uh, you know should be smelly, you can say so. These are some default configurations. For example, we say that uh, too many instance variables are when there are more than nine but uh, a, a method has too many parameters, but it has more than three. Unless it's a constructor, then we're okay with, uh, when it has five. So we can, we can configure it in a very uh, big detail. And also, you can configure it on a, oh yeah, so uh, if, if you're like Tom and you really don't like getters, you can actually enable the smell that will flag all of your getters uh, in one go. So uh, you can all also configure it on a per method basis in comments. So whenever you edit that method, you will, if you add another duplicate method call, it will flag again. So it can be like, I'm okay with two, but maybe 
with three, I'm not okay, so whenever somebody adds another check, it will be a problem. So these are good things when you have an existing code base that is really smelly, but want to, uh, want to flag all the existing smells as, okay, for now, I will refactor them later or get somebody to refactor them later. I just don't want to introduce new ones. Uh, so making Rick happy with my code was what taught me the most OOP in the last year, but please always be critical of such tools. And uh, there are many reasons why you should be or could be critical and you know, there are times when those tools are just nudging you in the right direction. So I'll skip this. Uh, this is a very good thing if you're not into Lisps, uh, but uh, yeah, so if, if this is the representation you would work on if you wanted to hack on Rig, which we really uh, encourage you to. And uh, also do not refactor your application <laughs> to this kind of state. <laughs> Thanks so much, the slides are on Salxchastel.net if you want to learn more, please come to RubyConf Portugal. I'll uh, show you refactorings to actually get you out of those smells. Thank you. I want to talk uh, about growing juniors and infinity. Yeah, my name is Malvina. So imagine a headhunter. They go to the forest and they're looking for seniors. Of course, they're always looking for seniors. But what about juniors? And what even about pre-juniors? Because if people look for juniors, they might, they say, okay, you're full stack and you have two years of experience. You know, that's a junior for people. Um, okay, you could say, well, they know too little, they ask too many questions, we don't have time, then they are maybe shy. But on the other hand, think about if you get juniors, you can grow the community and you can influence them and you can teach them best practice right away. For example, my colleague Luca uh, Sky, uh, wrote me a message on Skype. Uh, quick quiz, how much is 0 0.9 minus 0 0.8? Are you sure? Try it in IRB. What do you get and why? So I went to IRB, typed it in, and then I was like, okay, I expected 0 0.1. And I think all of you are at the moment like, well, I knew that. But do you really know why that happens? So I did a research. So 0 0.1 is, of course, in decimal 1 over 10, which is in binary 1 over 1010. And now, if you start to divide 1 by 1010, of course, you first you have to get down these zeros. Um, this is, by the way, the American division notation. So yeah, we have the numerator there, the one, and the denominator to the left, and up there's the result. And what we see here is that the 100, like the 100, zero zero, um, comes up again and again and again, and fractions in binary only terminate if the denominator has two as the only prime factor. Um, so this repeats forever, which then looks something like this. And, but, you know, in computers, we don't have this periodical bar. We have only a certain finite number of bits, right? So at some point, there's a rounding happening. And, um, yeah, so we have, we, we are thinking of 0 0.1 and doing our stuff. And uh, then in the computer, the computer just takes all the bit that it can take and then rounds the last bit and then puts it back to decimal, and of course, if you round something, it will not be uh, the same anymore. So unprecise, real, uh, unprecise results, of course, they hurt, especially if you're working with money, and if you have a business that uh, um, puts money from one, from one account to the other. Um, so how can we handle it? So my colleagues too told me things. Uh, we can use integers as long as possible and just in the end calculate with floating point numbers. We can learn about big decimal or we can always read about the IE754 standard for floating point arithmetic. So if you want to grow juniors too now and you don't have a company to support them, well, you can always support um, beginners workshops like Red Skirts or Closure Bridge, which we just recently had in Berlin. Um, yes, you can support learning groups and uh, all kinds of workshops. Yeah, thanks. That's all what I have. Hi, I'm Felipe Espinosa. I work in Hyper. Um, 
come from Norway. Uh, so I'm going to talk really briefly uh, something about what we do in the company, uh, about MOOCs and API design workflow. But why start? Uh, we do a lot of iOS and Android applications, and those applications need to connect to a backend. So we kind of like uh, wanted to improve this work, uh, the workflow, the way we work with iOS and Android developers, just to kind of like make uh, the whole process better. So we kind of like got this approach that is co uh, consists about like uh, making API proposals in Markdown, discuss it, agree on, on them. Uh, mock this, these uh, agreements, the, the endpoints, and then like uh, just start working on. So initially, uh, it's a it's a markdown document where you says like the name of the endpoint, the request parameters, the headers, what kind of result, and most importantly, the rationale. Why do we need this endpoint? So this is uh, because it's markdown, and both iOS and backend developers can can do this. So we kind of like see really early, like uh, if the, the endpoint is doing something that we want uh, or not, or if we need some data or it makes sense or not for the, the consumers. That's the whole point of it. So after that, uh, anyone can make a pull request out of it and we are gonna discuss it. So uh, there is a lot of addition and conversation back and forth until we say, okay, uh, this is uh, good to go. We can start with working with that. So merge the pull request, and after uh, uh, we can just mock it on the on the um, Rails backend to start serving this mock endpoint, mock data, on just a JSON file, uh, in order to to kind of like really quickly deliver this this uh, agreement. So uh, after this, for example, this is the pull client for Mac. So you can uh, start using the endpoint, and like at some point you replace the, the mock data with the real data, and if you uh, um, agree in the in the um, in the contract that you made with the with the API design, everything is, should work like perfectly. So this was a, a little bit of an experiment that we did now, and it worked quite well because like uh, well we had also the iOS developers doing this. And we, they didn't have to wait until we implement all the functionality in order to be, start working on the UI parts and, the, and displaying the data, and like the all network connection. And also, uh, is, or the most important key or takeaway is that uh, you get to design the API, but the perspective uh, of the clients. Because like, uh, as a backend developer, in my experience, I. I've many times I've designed APIs, but like they are thought of my point of view, not what the client really needs. So after that, I just say like I did this uh, really small uh, gem for Rails to do these uh, helpers for quickly serve these uh, JSON files, and well, check uh, Hyper Oslo because we have a lot of cool other open source stuff. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Bruno, and tonight or today I want to talk to you about Tmux plugins. So I want to start with a question. Uh, how many of you are using Tmux either on a server or uh, as your development environment? Okay, a couple of people. So you know what it is, all right. So I'm not going to talk about what Tmux is. Uh, I'm going to talk about, you know, an extension to Tmux, Tmux plugins. Um, Tmux is great for managing your development environment and it's great for command line productivity, right? So we are Ruby developers, Rails developers, and we have things like Rails server. We start that from the command line. We have to use Git. Uh, we have to use uh, maybe a side processes like Memcached, Redis, stuff like that. And we run and uh, interact with, with the command line a lot on a daily basis, I think. Uh, so, you know, uh, Tmux enables you to manage all your command line stuff better. And if you're maybe using Vim from the command line, that's where Tmux uh, comes in great. As I mentioned at the start, I wanna talk to you about Tmux plugins, right? So Tmux has plugins, and you, you might know, not know that because that's like a relatively new thing uh, since a year ago or so. Um, you can check out plugins on github.com, Tmux plugins. I'm gonna show it to you. 
I will just uh, slide through the through these collections. So there's uh, about uh, 20 plugins so far, uh, all the way from, for example, plugin manager uh, to um, enhancing some uh, functionality that Tmux doesn't have, so, uh, for example, uh, regex searches. Uh, then there's like uh, basic things like uh, Tmux sensible, some uh, sensible configuration options you would really expect to have um, just like when you install Tmux, but for some reason it's not there, and it's even uh, fixing some bugs that come with Tmux. Um, so, so, you know, things like that. Uh, tonight I wanna show you um, a Tmux plugin that a lot of users find useful, I think, um, and it's called Tmux Resurrect. You know, uh, what it does is basically it enables you to restore Tmux environment after you restart your computer. So let's check it out. All right, I have Tmux here in the window. Do you see? So this this window, uh, and you know what? I, I fired up a simple Rails application in a in a window. I'm running Vim. I like Vim. I hope you do too. Uh, so this is a gem file. Nothing special. This is a controller. Um, not much to show really. Then I have, of course, Rails server. Uh, I started from the command line. Then what I do, for some reason, I decided to just check out curl man page over here. And lastly, a cat. Everyone li likes cats, uh, and this might be the first time you see a cat in the command line. And uh, no, it's not like a hoax, no, it's not a scam, it's a real Unicode and 256 colors cat in the command line, yay. So, um, you know, uh, as I mentioned, we're in Tmux, right? And say, so this is like a really, this might be like a cozy, you know, development environment for you, but now you have to, for some reason, restart a computer. Maybe you have to upgrade it uh, or something similar. And you know what? Uh, you have to, you know, scratch the whole Tmux uh, configuration and all this cozy environment is gone. That's where Tmux Resurrect steps in. It enables you to save everything you saw, everything I showed you right now. So we're going to, uh, you know, I, I have it, everything set up, saved. Uh, so I'm going to save this Tmux environment right now. I'm going to press uh, prefix, control S. All right, it says Tmux environment saved. All right, so I'm gonna do, you know, scratch this whole environment now. Kill server. It's all gone. So let's pretend, you know, I restarted my computer, I upgraded it, whatever, and I'm gonna start Tmux again. As you can see, I have a blank, uh, blank pane right now. My whole environment is gone, but I can restore it right now with prefix control S, uh, control R, sorry. All right, I got a message, Tmux restore complete. And let's check out what, what it, Oh, sorry. So yeah, uh, we have everything rest uh, restored. Uh, Wim is already running. The cursor is at the exact location I left it. Um, Rail server is, again is running. It started automatically. Man page is restored and the cat, the cat picture is also restored. Thank you. Um, I came up here to tell you that it's uh, September 1st. It's 6.15 p.m. And the Ruby community has 230,000 problems plus minus 99. Um, and with problems, I mean open issues on GitHub. So this is sort of good news because I've been told developers like to solve issues. And I don't know if that's true because I'm mostly a designer. That all changed though as, um, as I walked into a Rails Girls workshop earlier this year. And I met Ruby, I met the command line and the community itself and it would have been madness not to stick around and try to solve problems myself. So where do you start? Go on GitHub. Nah, seriously, like, where do you start, right? So it's, uh, it's kind of tricky to find projects that are worthwhile your time. And um, thus, I decided to solve the problem of finding problems first. And therefore, I would like to introduce Ruby issues which is a curated mailing list of open source issues on, um, that are on GitHub right now. Uh, curated, I mean, we estimate the necessary skill set 
that you need to uh, solve the issue. Uh, we try to get in touch with the maintainer in advance and um, see if he's responsive. So, oh, sorry, <laughs> wrong button. Um, what about this? So the response has been quite good, I think. So there's been some issues that have been solved, fixing bugs, um, fixing um, zombie links, for example, adding some missing trans uh, translations. But I'd love to see some of the more sophisticated issues being taken on. And I'm in a unique position, and it's very humbling that this project is a sponsored one. So I work for Magic Labs, and our community work is sponsored by Odin. But Ruby Issues is really about you and the open software tools that you use. Because in the end, um, until we find a way how to sustainably do open source work and make that available for everybody, you know, we have to, um, sorry, until we figure, th figure that out, it would be nice to help each other out here. So with that being said, um, I'd like to hear about your issues. I'd like some feedback. I'd also like some subs subscribers, but uh, really I would like to see the number of open issues going down. And that's all, folks. Hello there. Uh, my name is Carlos Paramio, that's my Twitter, and um, I consider myself a uh, DevOps, and as you know, ops are lazy, we Ruby devs are lazy, so the combination of those two is like the constant desire of having siesta all the time. So uh, in order to have more spare time to read Hacker News and do other stuff, it's usual that we build our own script to do automate tasks that are, we need to do on a daily basis. So uh, you start to create those scripts, uh, you start to share them with uh, your uh, partners in the team, but then you discover that some of the tasks are useful to be triggered for other members of the team that are not technical or that uh, contains um, credentials that you don't, should not share, etc. So at the end you need basically to be around or have a restless uh, companion like a bot uh, in your channel to trigger those actions uh, safely, only for the users that should uh, have access to. So as you know, there is a very common uh, bot uh, that works with a lot of adapters and services out there, which is Ubot, which is uh, by the great guys of uh, GitHub, uh, written in CoffeeScript, runs in Node.js, but of course, we want an alternative in our uh, preferred language, uh, our other language, which is Lita. It has been around for a while, and uh, I just wanted to, to show how easy it is to write handlers for it and uh, connect it to your, um, to your uh, uh, chatting system, etc. even HTTP services. So basically, uh, it brings with a lot of, uh, comes with a lot of adapters for HitChat, Campfire, IRC, et cetera, Slack, um, all the common ones. Uh, there is tons and tons of plugins, um, and it's really easy to write your own handler to respond to certain messages. So uh, you just write a little handler, Baruco, for example, and then it creates you uh, some files, uh, proper directory, Baruco, and then you just need inside that file to define routes. Those routes are gonna be uh, regular expressions, the matches for a certain string, uh, you can uh, scan part of that string so you can pass parameters, and then you uh, say which method you want to be called inside that handler. Then inside that handler you always get a response, and then that object little response object answers to a lot of other methods like reply and uh, which will replay with that message that you can post in the public channel or you can reply private, privately, etc. Uh, you can restrict the execution of that handler or, the, or the, that particular route to a certain group of users and then uh, you can interact with Lita uh, in the channel directly to tell, okay, you can add now Carlos to this group, Ruby Dev, so he can trigger that action. Uh, some of the methods that you can use for the, from that response object are, as I said, reply, reply privately. You can collect the, the matches on the string to get the arguments, uh, read the entire message, check the uh, user settings, like uh, the ID of the user in that service, etc. Um, and you, it brings also 
with a lot of clients, like a uh, Redis client, because it uses Redis for his uh, brain, uh, HTTP client, translate, uh, read the configuration in case that you want to store uh, uh, the credentials, etc. It's very easy to use. Um, as a sample also, uh, you, can, uh, you can populate uh, an entire HTTP interface in case that you want to automate the stuff with another application, it's very easy, like a, uh, creating a git hook and uh, call this particular path when someone pushes and uh, uh, it just uh, uh, will call this, uh, this another method. Uh, and of course, for the HTTP interface, you can also collect um, arguments and have your models or whatever you want to do there. And for example, fetch information from your ticketing system and output it on, on the channel. Uh, even has a timer already implemented inside, so you can uh, delay a response for five seconds after the trigger was done or uh, repeat a process each uh, 60 seconds. So that's all, check uh, the gems that are out there. I wrote uh, some for engineers. I, I hope you find it interesting. Thanks. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Robin. Um, I live in Berlin um, and I moved from Hamburg uh, two years ago to Berlin. Um, I run a consultancy which is called Magic Labs. Um, this is my Twitter handle, this is uh, me on GitHub. Um, and I want to talk about uh, the Alchemy CMS, um, which is uh, basically a content management system um, written on top of Rails, um, open source on GitHub. And um, I was wondering um, how many of you already know about this project or have heard about it or even used it? So I see a few hands. So not, not that popular, but uh, I see a few hands. Okay, that's cool. Um, uh, this project uh, was um, founded in 2007. Um, it was proprietary and uh, it was open source in 2010. Um, it's licensed under a BSD license. And um, <clears throat> uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I just go on. Um, what, what is Alchemy CMS? Or what does it provide? And uh, so my first point is um, we have a strict uh, separation of content and markup, um, which is basically the, the fundamental aspect of, of Alchemy. Um, we think it's, it's important uh, that we have plain content instead of um, mixing content with markup. Um, and if you do that you, you have uh, freedom on the designer side and uh, you have flexibility on the developer side and how you deliver your content. Like you can just render HTML, you can render your content as JSON, XML or whatever. Um, another thing is um, the usage for the editor, which um, is, yeah, I think it's, it's easy or it should be easy. So Acme uh, focuses on, on uh, a good uh, user experience and um, Try or Acme tries to um, to be um, to be less complex and um, to uh, to reduce complexity whenever possible in in the back end on, on, on the UI side. Um, also, flexibility for the developer. Um, of course, um, it's it's built on top on, on Rails, so it means um, we um, have all the benefits from Rails. Um, it's a Ruby gem. Um, it, it's mountable, you can just um, mount it in your host application, so you have the freedom to, to develop your, your own uh, individual model views, controllers, everything um, you want to have in, in, your, in your very individual application, and just um, get the um, features from, from some CMS uh, behind that. Um, freedom for the designer um, is quite related to the first point, um, which means um, due to the fact that um, the separation of content and markup is a thing, um, the designer is completely um, independent of, of designing uh, the website because um, the designer is in control, in, in full control of um, the markup and the styling, 
and there's no, no requirement given or, or anything um, which comes from the CMS or some, somewhere else. And um, yeah, that's, that's another important point here. Um, this is uh, the website. Um, of course, you can find it on, on RubyGems also, but uh, you can find some more details here. You can uh, try the demo um, or just uh, yeah, contact me and that's it. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Jan. I work at Hitfox. I used to be a Ruby developer, um, then I turned into a JavaScript developer. These days, I describe myself, uh, my job more as a programming cheerleader for our team of developers. The people on my team love Rails, and they love SAS, and they love JavaScript, they love React, but they really don't love the asset pipeline so much because it's inflexible. It doesn't allow for much customization in how your assets are processed. Try to integrate things like CSS post-processors, Babel.js, or module systems, and you're entering a world of pain. In 2015, it still doesn't support source maps. It wants you to use gems to manage your JavaScript dependencies. It wants you to concatenate all your JavaScript into one big blob, whereas what you really want to do, actually, as a JavaScript developer, is to use NPM for proper module management, Webpack to bundle your stuff for the browser, and Gulp to finely tune how everything is processed. In short, the asset pipeline is nice for sprinkling some jQuery on top of your views, but it's inadequate for sophisticated front-end development and single-page apps. So what's Rails' solution to this? Turbolinks. You're supposed to build your front-end in the back-end, basically. I'm not a big fan of this. Something a lot of people do now is to build two apps. They build their back-end API with Rails, and whatever front-end stack they like to build a single-page app. That might work fine for you, but it comes with uh, disadvantages. Deployment gets much more complicated, too complicated for simple apps. You need everything in sync. You need to keep the two code bases in sync. So I was looking for a solution that would let me integrate Rails and Gulp. I found something that I think works quite nicely. It has a very boring name. Let me show you the Gulp Assets gem. Gulp Assets has exactly five features. First, to initialize your app, running the provided generator installs a directory structure, a package JSON, and the Gulp file into your repo. The second feature is the built-in Webpack dev server you have to launch with npm start in parallel to Rails. Why do you need a separate server? Can't Rails serve the files by itself, you might wonder? Yes, but using the Webpack dev server allows us to use Webpack's awesome hot code reloading functionality. It also makes it possible, theoretically, to serve front-end assets without actually spinning up Rails so our designers don't have to install Postgres to write CSS. The Gulp process started with npm start also takes care of watching and recompiling files and running a live reload server. The live reload client is automatically injected into your Rails views during the, uh, using the REC live reload middleware. And third, the gem provides a couple of helpers to generate links in your Rails views to the output files that are created by Gulp assets. Using these helpers generates proper links for dev or production environments, pointing either to the dev server or to the hashed file names that are created for production. We also hook into the Rake Assets precompile task to trigger a Gulp production build whenever you precompile your assets. This means you don't have to change your deployment scripts much. Just make sure that Node is available on the server and that you run npm install whenever you also run bundle install. Finally, I don't actually want to replace the asset pipeline. There are still valid uses for it, and developers working on less fancy pages might be happier just copy-pasting jQuery code from Stack Overflow into the app assets directory. 
GALB assets is designed to work side by side in harmony with the asset pipeline as long as your file names don't conflict. You can find a detailed readme page uh, on our GitHub repository. Um, that thing is on Ruby gems in a pre-release version. So if you want to give it a try, you need to specify the pre-suffix uh, in the gem version. Um, finally, I'm presenting this here because I think this is really useful. I know a lot of people who had the same problem um, and I would really love to get some feedback on it and some help. Thank you very much. Woo. Hi, everyone. Sorry. Um, this, called, this talk is called Metaprogram Methods and uh, Performance. Um, Toby, you can find me as Cracktop, and I'm from BitCrowd. That's what that airship really looks like. Um, so what is metaprogramming? Metaprogramming is code that writes code. And I want to talk about the performance uh, of that a bit. But this is not about the performance of the method definition time or the direct call overhead. If you want to learn more about that, uh, there's a link. I'm going to put these slides online. I'm going to tweet them out uh, from Aaron, um, who did a very in-depth analysis of memory, CPU, and everything that is involved with that. So we're going to do a simplified example, but this is real code, live code from my beloved uh, Shoes 4, which I'm working on. And so let's start. Um, we're going to have a fake dimensions class. Um, shoes is UI programming, so we need lots of dimensions to uh, position objects everywhere. So this is just a simple fake dimensions thing. It is initialized with a margin start, and then it has a method to check whether value is relative and then it calculates uh, the relative value, which is if the margin is given as a rational, like uh, has a float, sorry, uh, like 0 0.1. So now we want to have a method that calculates our margin start. And at first, we're going to define the full metaprogramming version of that method as I would usually define it. So we do define method, full meta. And then at first, we have to get the instance variable name. Here, be aware that this looks stupid here now. But in the real world, of course, we have some sort of data structure we have where we have lots of different symbols. There's not only margin start and margin end, but that's why this is a simplified example. So we create the instance variable name, we get the instance variable, and then we do the relative calculation. Second, um, a bit different, we uh, get the instance variable, uh, instance variable name right from the start as a constant, so we don't have to do the reallocations all the time, do the same stuff. Then, for comparison's sake, we have the direct uh, instance variable access without instance variable get. And then we have one version where we uh, just do a bad, bad evil of uh, <laughs> the code as a string. So we can potentially interpolate it if we want to do like really replace values in there. And then the normal method, which we call full direct. And then let's benchmark that um, IPS style, as we learned in the performancing talk. That doesn't look so well, but it just uh, creates a fake dimensions class and calls each of these methods and reports. So what do we see? Um, the full direct is, of course, the fastest, but our full meta is much, much slower. And still, the direct instance variable access is 1.2 times slower. This is because the defined method takes a block, uh, which then uh, creates a closure and has to get all the variables from around blah, blah, blah. And now the computer is locked. <laughs> I cannot handle Max, I'm sorry. Thank you, Jan. Um, but we see full meta is 3.3 times slower. Like, what the hell? What is happening? Let's have a look at it again. This is the full direct version, and this is full meta. And we can see here we cre first create one string, we create another string, and then another string when we add them both together and we do an instance variable get. But even if we remove the first uh, creation of the string and we put it into constant, which we could also freeze, if we use that version, it is still, it is still two times slower. Like, what the fuck? What is happening? Um, <laughs> and that's due to, like, my assumption is, it's due to the one is the block over it, which was 0 0.2 times, and then instance variable get in that case, shows us how slow it is compared to normal direct access. And that was really surprising for me. And you would say, this is a super micro benchmark. Like, does it matter? It's like, does it? Maybe not. Unless you use that method a lot. 
This is the actual pull request, which my friend Jason R. Clark did, and we discussed about, like, is that relevant? Do we need that performance improvement? By the way, this is me and uh, Jason programming together at Eurocamp, discussing about stuff. And to quote Jason, uh, Jason uh, he ran an example of ours, and he said, and yes, you read that right. Shoes dimension extent was called eight million times. And no matter what you're gonna shove off, that's good. And obviously, we should reduce the call count but dimensions are always bound to be in a hot path. So if you have a method that gets called that much, then that, these sort of uh, performance optimizations can be very helpful. Otherwise, maybe not. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, my name is Simon Perupolitsa. Do you know what this is? Hands up, do you know what this is? Okay, for those of you who don't know, let's take this example. Here's a class that's uh, an infinite range th that can have an infinite bound. So, for example, from one to infinite, uh, it covers 100, and it does not cover minus 10. So, when we run this, you can see that it works correctly. Well, let's try, uh, let's try Ruby dash W. Oops, we have made an error there. So, Ruby wants to help you. But uh, does anybody actually use this in your Rails projects? Hands up. <laughs> um, <laughs> very low hands, okay. Let's run a demo. So I have enabled uh, the verbose mode here in my Rails application, and let's try to start it. So this is what you get. That's, that's all the warnings that come from all, the, all of your dependencies, all the gems, like um, awesome nested net set, um, some, somewhere else, money, dragonfly. You don't want that. Okay, let me try one more thing. That's a boot RB file. Just don't comment this. Try it one more time. Wow. Look at that. You get your warnings, but none of those warnings from all of your gems. Cool, right? <laughs> so, are you not sold yet? This is what you do. Just use this gem and those, put those three lines of code uh, in your config booter that are B, and that's it. So. <laughs> Hello. Oh. So I'm here to present you Altable, or all naive Ruby one-liner beats Rust. Uh, by one-liner, I mean a couple of lines, and by beats Rust, I mean uh, rusty code. So I work at Shopify. At Shopify, can I see my presenter notes on that? Uh, okay, well, I'll try to rem remember. So at Shopify, there's one cool thing that I like about uh, the company is that we run on the exact same code base since 2006. Um, so we don't know about the um, second system syndrome, not at all. Uh, but there's also one side, is, uh, one bad side, is that we run on the same code base in 2006. So we end up with controllers like that. Uh, time goes by, bugs get fixed, um, features are added, and we have that thing. Pretty, pretty bad. Uh, lots of before actions, rescue from. So if you take a look at the size of that controller, it's almost the size of the Empire State Building. <laughs> but don't worry, that talk is not about skyscrapers. <laughs> So I'd like, you to, I'd like you to focus on all those before actions. Can anyone tell me what the pay action does? Yeah, well, that's, that was also our uh, reaction. So there's actually an action called pay, and we still don't know what it does, and we still haven't seen the, the, code, the code relative to the action. Uh, so that's pretty bad. 
we want our controllers, our actions to be described as stories. We want to be able to tell them, like, to tell easily what they're doing. So we introduce a small pattern called Altable. First thing you can realize about that code, I don't know if Lauren is still in the room, but that's a sonnet. I added some rhymes at the end. A, B, A, B, yeah. Second thing is that it's readable. You understand right away like what this code does. So the way this works is that each and every step of the flow is responsible to either bail out or um, interrupt the flow. We, inter and we introduce a small keyword called alt that uh, simply enables the flow to, uh, to, uh, to be interrupted. So we wrap all the steps of the flow into an altable keywords. And uh, it really, really is super easy. So to uh, how altable works, you first define an identity function. Um, <laughs> no, that's, whoa. That's not true at all. So it's simply a uh, throw and catch around, uh, around the flow. So that enables us to describe all our, all our actions with stories, simple steps that are reusable. So we don't have any more uh, before filters. We don't have any more uh, special rescue from in our, in our uh, controller. And the controller is super simple. I'm Christian. I work, well, you'll see a slide there at one point. Yeah, maybe not. So I'm Christian. I work at Shopify. Uh, feel free to ping me if you have any questions. Thanks. Hello, uh, my name is Gavin Joyce. I'm an engineer at Intercom. Um, if you're not aware of what Intercom is, it's a uh, tool. Our mission is to uh, make web business personal. It's a tool you can embed in your mobile and web applications, have uh, conversations with your customers, um, engage your customers by sending messages to them at the right time, support them, uh, and learn what they're doing within your product. Uh, I'm going to give a quick talk on a gem that we use called mutations. I'll come back to some of the details uh, in a minute. Uh, I'm sure everyone's familiar with MVC. Uh, we have a client application. In our case, we have uh, multiple client applications, iOS, Android, SDK, uh, uh, libraries, uh, quite a large Ember JS application, and then uh, customer applications which are built on our set of APIs. So in this case, the view layer in Rails isn't that useful to us. Um, so we simply don't use it. Uh, our controllers are really a, uh, a set of APIs. Um, there's mobile M APIs, Ember APIs, and then public APIs. Uh, our database, we've many of them. And we've uh, 100 models plus and 40 engineers uh, who work on the Rails application uh, pretty regularly. Um, so. Uh, that should say 100 models, but um, it's obviously very complex. Uh, active record models have got quite a large surface area. Um, uh, I'm sure also some of you are familiar with callback hell, where you uh, create a couple of callbacks and then all of a sudden come back a few months later and it's like a Rube Goldberg machine. Um, it's very brittle. Uh, mutations is something that we use to tame that complexity. Uh, here is a mutation. Um, in this case, it's a list command. It uh, defines that an app ID is required. It's an integer. It's got three optional parameters. Um, you can see this state string uh, can be one of four actual strings. And then within the execute method, we have a very clean context uh, where we can actually run some logic. So in this case, it just returns a page list of uh, mess serialized messages. Um, here's how you invoke one of these commands. Uh, you run, you can uh, call the run, uh, uh, method. Um, mutations can take a series of hashes. Uh, subsequent hashes uh, take precedent over previous ones, meaning you can uh, accept untrusted parameters from uh, 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 HTTP and override some things that you care about, like uh, ID or app ID or something like that. Um, so 100 models, uh, we use mutations in a number of places in our Rails application. Uh, one is to provide internal APIs um, that uh, encapsulate the complexity of some of the related models. Uh, so in our case, we have uh, three instances at least that we use it um, by different teams. Uh, these are logically decoupled. Again, it's all started part of the one Rails application, but uh, the mutation APIs uh, hide the complexity. Um, so our APIs use those. We also use mutations to define the external APIs. And uh, 
this is still a monolithic Rails application, but uh, the nice thing about this is it's preparing, uh, uh, it's preparing us for the, the time where we actually physically decouple these, uh, the user message and conversation APIs will very easily be uh, uh, extracted to actual physical services. Um, if you have any questions, there's five, uh, me and four other intercomrades uh, here, so uh, come talk to us. And thanks very much.